Yes. Excellent. Yeah, we are live now. Yes. Great. Thanks everybody Great. for joining. Asia is one of the largest countries uh, charting their own territories in the digital eco space, where uh, India and China, the largest countries, India has crossed uh, 300 billion USD or around 12% of GDP, and China more than 5 trillion or one third of its own GDP. It will be important to note where we have opportunities for more equitable growth. Uh, for example, the economic integration of Southeast Asia, this is what we had talked about in earlier session, which would turn a region with a population of a little under 700 million and a nominal GDP of about $6.5 trillion into one of the world's biggest and potentially most dynamic emerging markets. That has been the aspiration of forward thinking regional leaders for decades. And the 10 nation ASEAN countries um, are well on their way, but a powerful new force, the rapid adoption of digital technology, today's topic, by the region's businesses and, and also by increasingly affluent consumers is complementing this government efforts, right? By making this common market a reality. The invisible data highways are bridging vast populations separated by a wide variety of languages and cultures through smartphones, the wireless internet, and social media. Companies are using this connectivity to offer new accessible services to the region's consumers. How Asia and especially ASEAN can keep pace as well as lead in the digital revolution that's happening in the post-pandemic world and do so in an equitable manner with access to all the stakeholders, be innovative in business and technology while being strategic in policy making is our ta topic today. We have a great panel of business leaders and experts from the region today, actually as it turns out from all over the globe, even including Europe. Uh, we'll st my first panelist, Stephen Edkins, Stephen, co-founder and chief CEO of Rice Exchange Singapore. He's an experienced entrepreneur, angel investor with interest in agriculture and renewable energy, Oxford trained economist. He had a venture capital firm with public uh, exits that were successful. He's also interested in the global rice trade following his involvement in a rice plantation and mill in Nigeria. Welcome, Stephen. If we can Thank start you. off with you and your opening statements, and for, this is true for everybody, for next two, which should not be more than two to three minutes. If you can give Stephen your perspectives of both the challenges and opportunities of this region in driving a cohesive digital strategy for equitable growth. Over to you, Stephen. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so uh, Rice Exchange is a completely digital platform which is um, helping to uh, make the trade um, particularly across Asia, because rice is very much an Asian commodity, um, uh, a lot smoother and more efficient. If you look at the way that um, not just uh, rice, but all commodities are traded today, uh, they're still uh, relying on very archaic systems. Uh, until about a year ago, they were still relying on paper um, for most of the sediment of those transactions. But what we have seen over over the last 12 months with COVID is a, a dramatic acceleration in a trend which was already beginning towards digitalization, electronic signatures, uh, and integration of, uh, of, um, of trading procedures more generally. Um, uh, we're seeing governments a lot more open towards digital solutions, um, both because it allows them to monitor better what's going on, um, but also because, to be honest, right now, you don't have the choice. Um, there is no, there's no other solution right now. But this is exciting times. It's going to, it's going to lead towards, um, uh, as I say, a much more efficient process. And the question is, who benefits from that? And and we believe everybody will benefit on our platform. All the stakeholders benefit, but the biggest beneficiaries will be the people at the beginning and at the end. So that's the farmers who are producing the rice. And that's the consumers um, uh, who are who are eating it on their plate. Um, they're the biggest beneficiaries. Uh, the producers will get a better price, and the consumers will will be will pay less for for what they were eating. Great. 
Thank you. So, so if we look around the region, we'll find plenty of evidence of digital's impact on consumption of goods and services, right? That until recently were relatively inaccessible. New online grocers and marketplaces I was looking at are allowing families in Jakarta, Singapore, Manila to have Australian organic beets to African condiments delivered to their doors today. Government agencies and e-commerce giants are building logistical and technological infrastructure, which should enable thousands of small enterprises as well, which is kind of important. So my next panelist, Ira, here, is a co-founder and C chairman and CEO of Illogical in the Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, which is a competitive physical commodities marketplace and that seeks to accelerate the evolution of market participants involved in trade and eliminate market inefficiencies. So Ira, if you can focus on during your opening statement, where you see similar opportunities for innovation, for Asian businesses and how it can better cooperate with government and society to build, to build better digital growth for uh, future of their citizens. Yeah, so uh, I think there are several like uh, very important uh, several very important issues to consider uh you know as far as you know developing here in the in the ASEAN, ASEAN region and i think uh that would revolve around innovation capacity and entrepreneurial capacity and also being able to develop you know innovation ecosystems within the region that will help to foster you know the development of you know um uh, the, uh, you know the infrastructure that's required for trade uh, of course, like, you know, um, human capital and bringing together all of the different stakeholders, you know, the corporates, the governments, the universities, the venture capital, and of course, the, um, you know, the entrepreneurs. So um, developing these types of ecosystems, like, you know, within, within, within the ASEAN region, I think is going to be very critical to, in, to improving the innovation and entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship capacity here in, in, in the region and to help spur um, that type of that type of trade here and um, and and technological innovation within within this country. I mean, within this region. Surely, surely, I, I agree. I think to capture the enormous opportunities, the co government, businesses, societies will need an ASEAN-wide strategy. I mean, Asia-wide in general, but ASEAN-wide specifically. So you'll need a digital ASEAN strategy, and by no means. Also, I would imagine that this imply a one-size-fits-all approach to Southeast Asia, right? Um, um, next panelist, Jarvis Chen is the managing director of Cinda Corporation in the UK and works with partners from all over the world on cross-border trade and uh, doing business globally. So, Jarvis, the digital integration of Southeast Asia is still in its early stages with different tariff and regulatory business regimes, which will continue to have an impact for the foreseeable future. But businesses that you deal with can actually help Asian governments now to get a better understanding of the evolving digital economy, right? And how to mobilize it to boost growth. And together, as I think um, um, uh, Ira also just suggested that together they can make it easier for data to flow across borders by updating regulations and improving data privacy and security. So in your experience and for your opening statement, would you like to point out how the regulatory bodies and government policies today are shaping to boost the digital economy based growth for the ASEAN? All right, thank you. Um, you know, so I'll be talking about, uh, you know, uh, sort of the issue um, surrounding uh, the regulatory framework uh, between, uh, you know, uh, the digital lending side um, and and the consumer side. Um, so, firstly, um, so um, you know, as uh, as digitalization, you know, becomes much more important, especially in the wake of COVID nineteen. So, um, so the governments around the region need to, um, you know, emphasize, you know, a a, a, le a leveling. Uh, uh, plate field, you know, for, for all participants in the region. Um, say, for example, um, you know, so a, as a digital lender, you've, you've got to, um, to, to, to ask 
um, you know, and to look into, um, you know, the, uh, the profile, um, you know, of the people, you know, you're lending money to. So, for example, so if, so if, um, so if the governments, you know, uh, can implement, you know, a proper, uh, you know, credit reference, you know, regime in, um, you know, across the, ASEAN countries, you know, that would be helpful, um, you know, to protect the businesses, you know, um, uh, as a, as a digital lender. Um, so, um, so secondly, um, so the government, you know, also need to, um, uh, address the issue of protecting, uh, 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 the consumers digitally. Um, so, uh, having said that, you know, uh, what I mean is that, you know, the governments, you know, can, um, can, um, can can put some legis- legislations you know in place. For example, um, so you know, so as a consumer, if you, you if you shop around on the internet, you um, you know you want to you want to keep away from any fraud. You know you want to keep away from any um, any uh, mistaken identity. Um, so say for example, um, in, so if uh, governments in the region uh, can put uh, like a, a proper consumer. You know, act into uh, legislation. That would be great for everybody. Um, so, for example, in the UK, um, you know, uh, the government back in 1974 um, pu- uh, put the law into legislation, uh, which um, which is called you know the Consumer Act uh, 1974. You know, which you know protects uh, the consumer. You know, from from any mispresentation uh, or any breach of contract. You know, by um, by the retail or um, you know what what a trader. Um, so so that means you know um, uh, the lender the, the lender is liable you know for um, you know for any joint compensation you know in breach of the contract you know committed by uh, by by the trader or any you know company. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks for your input. I'll have a follow-up to that uh, as we uh, do follow-ups for the rest of the gang. And the last panelist, uh, Srikar Reddy, Chief Executive Officer of Sonata Software. Uh, Srikar has been with Sonata, which is a public company in India since 1986. Srikar has made Sonata one of the fastest growing IT solutions company uh, and also recently recognized as one of the 10 most valuable CEOs in the large enterprise category in India. Congratulations, Shrikar. Uh, in your opening statements in the next three minutes or so, if you could please highlight how India has developed its digital e- economy over the last decade and what are the learnings maybe that can also be applied to other parts of Asia, including the ASEAN region. I mean, it's a give and take, but I think uh, we can discuss the two way learnings as well, uh, especially since you're running the global business. Right. Uh, thank you. Avi and uh, glad to be here. Thanks to Harassis. Yeah, I think I'll try to make two or three points. Uh, one is, I think, if you look at the immediate recent past, uh, somebody said there has been more digital transformation in the last nine months than has been done in the last nine years. So, so I think some events have forced the world to get more digital. I mean, not just everything. Is, I mean, this whole meeting is today digital. Normally, we would have had it uh, physical kind of stuff. The second is, I think, uh, India over the last, obviously, 10 years uh, has uh, has built a huge kind of, uh, you know, digital uh, business models presence uh, across, across the spectrum. Uh, there are two things to watch out there for, really. Uh, one is, I think, the people uh, who are participating in the, uh, in the opportunity. And the second is the people who are not participating in the opportunity. Uh, there are, uh, I think, still a certain level of uh, inequity there uh, in terms of access of, I think, basic uh, digital infrastructure. While there are still people talk about smartphones, but there are not many people who have smartphones. And one of the recent issues with the pandemic has been the lack of access to uh, people without the means to get uh, quality education, which others were, were getting. And the last point I'd like to make is I think uh, uh, that at least uh, economies like India or maybe I don't know whether it works out in ASEAN is that just replicating successful global models in India don't work. And that I think a lot of people have now uh, realized uh, to their dismay. Uh, so I think you need you need business models uh, which are specific uh, to at least a large country like India. Uh, you can take something and 
and tailor it. But I don't think you can just uh, parachute it in. And that's, I think, a lot of people have realized. I think these are two, three points I'd like to make up. Great. Thanks, Seeker. Uh, so, Stephen, uh, getting back to you, uh, I mean, you know, Southeast Asian economies have posted some of the world's most stable economic growth over the last uh, decade or so. Its combined GDP, as I mentioned earlier, is seven trillion, which is measured in the purchasing power parity. And if you take it uh, together, it's equivalent of the world's fourth largest economy. Uh, the two questions or two sort of points that come to my mind. What are the binding mega trends that's making this possible in, from your point of view? Uh, I I read that it was, and I learned through also doing business there that probably urbanization is driving affluence. So that could be one of the reasons, but would like to definitely hear a more detailed point from you and anybody else who wants to jump in. But at the same time, when we talk about digital economy, only 5.5 billion in e-commerce, right? For a $7 trillion economy. So that's not, that's like less than 1% of total retail sales across the region. So, so there's opportunity, right? Opportunity for huge growth there. Uh, I read somewhere that it would be up to 100 billion in uh, the next five years. But what would really uh, drive that? And if you could also answer the first questions, um, what are the mega trends making this uh, region tick? Sure. Um, so unlike, uh, say, China, um, it's actually is composed of a number of different countries. And of course, every time you have a country, you have a border, and you have friction, uh, and it, it makes commerce uh, more difficult. And so I think the biggest driver I see is for um, uh, trade, reducing trade friction between the countries of, of, of ASEAN. We see that again in rice. Um, some countries are, are importers and some countries are exporters. Um, uh, and the amount, of, um, the amount of trade is going up. But uh, as we move towards digital uh, uh, solutions generally for that, we expect the amount of trade to, to increase significantly more. Uh, and then um, I think the other thing is just digitalization generally um, will uh, is, is increasing over time, but uh, we should see ASEAN generally start to catch up, um, uh, especially with East and North Asia. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, back to you, Ira. Uh, much work uh, remains to be done in harmonizing t tariff rates and this is you know after you and I spoke I looked into that a little bit because uh, the regulations have to be developed before goods can really freely, freely flow across uh, borders within the ASEAN right so there is today currently and you can correct me if I'm wrong no region-wide system for real-time cross-border payments for example and taxes on e-commerce also varies right quite a bit so the scale and reach of e-commerce platforms, while they can create an enormous new market, right, for Southeast Asian enterprises, which are, you know, even if you just consider that market, it's like hundreds of millions of connected consumers at a minimal cost, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so two questions to you. So do you think uh, it's time and do you see uh, the effort needed to really create the region-wide system for free movements of goods and services? And also, do you think technology companies specifically are putting in place much of the infrastructure needed for a regional digital marketplace? I'm sorry, could, could you repeat the second question again, please? Uh, the tech companies that are operating, and there are a lot of now, not only just global tech companies operating, but also local you know, startups that are doing uh, coming up and are getting well good funding, are they putting in place much of the infrastructure, which I mean the logical infrastructure and digi digital infrastructure for a regional digital marketplace? Are, are they making the investment that's needed? Okay, so uh, on the first question, I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's very important to consider uh, barriers to entry and, and, and lowering them. So um, you alluded to tariffs earlier, and I think that that's a huge bar barrier to entry from an economic point of view. So if, if the region can somehow 
come together, um, again, alluding to the government as a, as a stakeholder and providing culture and, and incentives, I think is going to be very critical, you know, when you look at it from an ecosystem point of view. Uh, and I think that that's going to help alleviate the barriers to entry to help foster trade within within the ASEAN region and also uh, foster the integration of, of, of the ASEAN as an economic block. On, on your second question with respect to um, the entrepreneurs uh, developing, you know, digital platforms and, uh, you know, with, with the other stakeholders like, you know, the venture capitalists and developing solutions to problems to help accelerate that process of integration. I really do think that, um, you know, as, um, <clears throat> as uh, um, Shikar mentioned earlier that, that, you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of things like, you know, that, that took place like you know in the last nine years were all compressed in the last nine months because of this because of covid i think you know um really you know uh rings true in 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 this particular case and so i think when when you bring you know those particular stakeholders um together you know the, the funding you know the, the um the the entrepreneurship along with the economic you know along with the economic incentives and and um uh, you know introducing things like um like science technology and mathematics courses you know looking improving entrepreneurship talent um increasing r d spend increasing risk risk capital increasing specialized um technical equipment physical space um custom customers for new innovations and customers for selections and startups so I think bringing all of these things together into like you know one singular ecosystem will definitely help spur and 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 and, and bring you know the market you know in, into a uh, singular integrated block. Okay, great, thank you, um, Jarvis. My next uh, question is towards you. Uh, uh, what I gather is that much of Southeast Asia. Uh, by the way, any of these questions, people feel free because we have time, you know, to jump in and make your points as well. It's not necessarily only pointed towards, you know, the name that I'm saying, because I, I, I'm sure we can all um, gain from collective wisdom of the uh, panelists. Yeah. But uh, uh, one thing that I did um, sort of study uh, in getting ready for this uh, session was that most of South Asia appears po to be poised to be directly from cash to digital payments. Today, cash and delivery is almost a necessity for everybody to have right as part of their strategy so skipping credit and debit cards uh, in the us you know there are 177 credit cards for every 100 people you know in thailand today there are about 29 per 100 and vietnam i think it's five or less and obviously use of atms and banks branches are also much lower uh, but what I did see is that digital payment was growing fast, uh, both in Thailand, obviously much, much more in Singapore, uh, and it's registering about 20% uh, in the last three to four uh, years. So digital accounts in this ASEAN countries uh, should really probably spur digital sales. But while the infrastructure is getting ready, uh, Jarvis, are you suggesting what do you suggesting your customers or how do you see this going do you think chinese players such as alipay or regional challenges like grab pay should come and solve this problem or do you see some other uh, players have to come in and like, solve this problem or i'm not necessarily calling it a problem but in order to real have digital payments facilitated what, what, where do you think this may go Oh, yes, indeed. You know, thank you for your question. So I think, um, you know, um, uh, digitalization, uh, you know, across uh, the, uh, you know, uh, digital payment um, sector uh, in the Southeast Asia region, you know, is relatively relatively low compared to um to to to, to North Asia, you know, mainly uh, in a um, in, in a in the China region, you know, which includes mainland China, Hong Kong, and Macau. Um, so, um, um, say for example, um, you know, um, if you know, if, if I were the government, you know, I, I you know, I would just you know um, advise you know uh, the digital players, you know, mainly, uh, uh, for example, may, maybe Alipay or Great or GrabPay, you know, they can just you know set up like a um, digital 
uh, digitalized, you know, platform, you know, for for, for the users to, to, to come in. Take for example, um, so uh, Alipay is widely used in China. Um, so for example, uh, if you have a debit card or credit card, you can just link it to your, you know, uh, digital payment accounts. You know, um, so so it will, you know, um, it can be used, you know, in shops. It can be used online. Uh, it, it can even pay your daily bill. It can also pay your tax bill. So uh, so uh, so so that is you know um, that's the way you know of moving forward. Um. So secondly, um, um. So I would like to point out that you know urbanization you know in the uh, ASEAN region you know uh, is also relative low compared to um, other regions you know in the world. You know. So if if the um, if the governments you know um, can you know um, spur uh, in infrastructure growth, you know, uh, what I mean is that you know, if the government can um, can 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 be build can build more roads, you know, can build more airports and can build more uh, hospitals, schools, you know, um, it can also um, you know um, uh, stimulate the economic growth, you know, from a, a digital point of view. Um, so, um, so the consumers, you know, are willing to spend more, you know, if you know, if you could get your delivery, if you could get your shipment, you know, faster enough, you know, if you buy something online. Right, right, right. Got it. Yeah. So, so not only just investment in digital infrastructure, but also in physical infrastructure, which exactly, means, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, so, uh, so Srikar, my next follow-up to you is, uh, again, from India's perspective, because you bring that perspective to us, uh, what does India need to do to close the gap with China in terms of the digital economy, right? Um, uh, is it, I mean, I, I guess it's a combination of things, but is it smartphone ownership? Is it much better investment, as we are discussing, across the board in digital infrastructure or some other capability to close the divide? between the rich and the poor in getting more digital access across all the segments of the population. What are some of these things? Um, and, I, and I don't mean comparison at all levels. I just... Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. I, I, yeah, I also felt that yeah. it would be a bit fair to compare India to right, China. Right, right, right. You know, long, long way to go. But I think the opportunity is, is, is humongous, I think, uh, yeah. for, for a country like India to use uh, digital technologies, digital infrastructure uh, to focus on a whole lot of, uh, I would say, citizenship services, whether it is smart cities using digitization to improve, you know, traffic and a whole lot of other stuff, which I think very big issue currently in most Indian uh, metropolis, digital delivery of uh, healthcare services, uh, digital, uh, you know, farming, you know, I mean, digital, uh, you know, I think uh, distribution of logistics, I think, there's a huge amount of, I think, uh, opportunity for India uh, to actually leapfrog a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, antiquated uh, processes. Uh, because I think, you know, there's this famous saying that India missed the mainframe revolution, went to PCs directly, and India missed the landline revolution and went to straight to smartphones. I yeah. think so. There are a lot of, uh, you know, opportunities. I think to use all this. Uh, to do it. So what it requires, obviously, is a whole lot of stuff, I guess, a will from the, uh, you know, like a, a will from the government uh, and then uh, simplifying the whole, uh, uh, you know, models for uh, uh, doing uh, businesses, uh, delivering uh, these uh, services, making the laws a lot more, uh, a lot more, I would say, uh, uh, simpler, I mean, for want of a be better term. Uh, otherwise, there is enough, I think, entrepreneurship and, you know, and the will to uh, drive these things in India today, I think. So, I mean, so there's a huge opportunity. I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, and uh, a lot can be done, uh, as I said. So, it's a question of, uh, uh, I think, will and some money. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, great. Uh, I mean, I think you're right. And I think... Um, uh, Thanks to even Chinese uh, investors, I think India has, uh, which has is, which is actually invested in a lot of Indian companies, right, in the digital economy. But similarly, uh, uh, one can notice that Chinese e-commerce giants are also investing heavily. And this is a question to the panel, pan you know, everybody can answer this, uh, heavily to build a footprint across Southeast Asia. So 
TencentJD.com, focusing on across Asian countries, right? Have uh, invested hundreds of millions of dollars. Alibaba invested a few billion dollars in Southeast Asian marketplaces. Uh, they offer like Chinese products in the region through its email facilities. Uh, it's invested in the Indonesian marketplace, Tokopedia. So with China so obviously heavily invested, uh, so what's the feeling there? I mean, uh, you guys obviously would welcome the cash part of it, money part of it. Uh, but what's the overall feeling? Is it uh, really uh, fostering the growth and uh, equitable growth as you expected for the, the digital economy? Or is it something that uh, you don't think it's still there yet? Meaning, does it come with a stick or is it all carrots? Uh, I don't know. I, I guess just one point that I'd like to make is that um, when you're um, when one refers to like a digital economy and equity, I think that there's somewhat of a negative relationship there. And I tend to think that the, um, you know, that the innovation driven entrepreneurship versus your, your traditional SME, uh, you know, really, really um, provide some sort of divergence in terms of like, you know, growth patterns um, where you look at the linear growth of an SME, uh, you know, there isn't as much risk in the beginning, but, you know, as, as far as earnings go, you know, it, it follows like a very linear path. And so that's the first point. Um, the second point is the when you look at an innovation driven um, innovation driven entrepreneurship, there's much more risk at you know built in into the front end, and so there's a lot of investment that goes into that. But then once you've crossed like you know the, the vertical axis, or at least like um, when it starts to go into positive territory in terms of earnings, you start to see exponential growth. And so. Um, uh, so, so, so speaking of like you know, I mean, equitable growth um, in in that respect, I, I just don't really see that um, taking place. I think that you know uh, the in the you know the innovation driven uh, innovation driven entrepreneurship is going to surpass by far the SMEs, which you know compose a very very large portion of the entire economy. So I think that's going to be the trend that we're going to be seeing going forward. Sure. Yeah. Both. Uh I mean, both Jarvis and Stephen, if you want to comment on it. I mean, essentially, would you take the current scenario or would you also insist on government playing a much bigger role along with, obviously, whoever else can invest, which Chinese are doing quite a bit of investment, right? So is it Chinese investment and, you know, startups, ingenuity and innovation? Or is it also governments coming in, which has been kind of slow? and addressing all these other complex shared challenge just that we have for both logical and physical infrastructure and all kinds of regulatory issues that must be resolved. So, um, uh, Can I, I I'll make a comment? I mean, I think, I think it is, if you look at capital, uh, investment capital is still quite trickled down. Um, Singapore is, is clearly the, the entry point for a lot of capital. Um, uh, and, and, and I think also for the actual startups as well, uh, there's obviously a lot of support there. Um, and it really is a question of how does this capital and this effort end up, uh, on the street in Jakarta or in, um, in Bangkok, uh, uh, and, and watching, uh, watching those flows of capital. I think also it's important that, um, you know, there, there'd be greater fostering of, of and, and encouragement of local startups um, trying to make it a little bit more decentralized, um, encouraging the entrepreneurial talent across the region. Um, I think that will happen. Uh, I and mean, we've seen that already. Um, if you look in, in places like Europe, you see there are many clusters now where they were not a decade ago. Uh, and I would expect the same thing to happen in, in Asia. Great. Yeah, so would you like to make a comment? Oh, oh yes, yes. You know, um, so I, so I'll just I would like to make point, uh, you know, of um, of lending, uh, you know, to traditional SMEs. You know, those companies, you know, are you know are you know are for, always just falling through the cracks, uh, you know, of not being able to. 
to um to to apply for a business loan um so uh, so um so traditionally uh you know banks are not willing to take you know uh, any risks you know from the SME um so um so um so um so I was just you know, give you guys an example you know of, of Alipay so Alipay is you know traditional uh, lending platform um you know you know which allows you know uh merchants and consumers um to apply uh, for a small loan, just ba- based on a credit file, you know, without um, pledging any, you know, access, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, to them. Um, so, uh, so, so you just need uh, all you do is just need to uh, fill out a form, uh, you know, within five within five minutes, and then you just get a decision instantly, you know, from your mobile mobile app. Um, um, so, uh, so if, um, so if, you know, if I was a traditional SME, you know, and, and I couldn't uh, reach out to, to a, to a traditional bank, you know, I'll probably just, you know, um, uh, be applying for a loan, you know, uh, you know, from, from, from the traditional, uh, yeah, fintech company or so, yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. I mean, uh, so, so why is some of these things are going to be ongoing and happening, which is companies drawing on the expertise to help governments upgrade the infrastructure needed for e-commerce, harmonize the digital regulatory framework, and to um, um, Aris point, you know, like uh, how it is very important to innovate, right, as a startup and SME. Um, I always felt, you know, even when it was happening in the U.S. and then, then later I saw it happening in India. But companies, local companies, meaning companies that are coming out of these regions, you know, not the Amazons or the Alibabas of the world, they have to be able to improve their ability to capture the big opportunities as well, rather than serve the needs, right? I mean, and then create a market which was not there before, like how India became a big market, right? I mean, it, before we used to go and produce out of India to deliver it to rest of the world. Now, any bona fide business wanting to do business, India is a big enough market. You, you can be a unicorn just, right? So, so this is the opportunity also for Southeast Asia, right? So, so does that require a change in mindset? Because, you know, digital innovators like the Google, Amazon, Grab, Netflixes of the world are, have set a very high bar, bar for customer expectations, right? which must be met, you know, and, and by local companies. And that cannot happen, Irat, just to extending your point, to piecemeal innovation, right? So that innovation has to be end to end of that customer journey and, you know, and, and that delivery of that promise, whether it's, you know, on uh, just the group goods and services or the experience or the conv- sake of convenience, right? So how in this last segment, I would like all of you guys, and obviously um, Shikhar to also uh, chime in here, how to approach digital transformation holistically by doing, uh, but it must be done by the local companies as well. First, whether you learn it, then, you know, apply that knowledge to your sort of region, all of that is fine, right? But how do we really learn and then make this digital transformation holistically and uh, rather than making it piecemeal, uh, I would like uh, your expert opinions on it. Uh, If I may. Uh, Yeah, so I think it's very important to consider, you know, problem-driven solutions and the connection between, you know, uh, solutions that are driven by, um, I mean, sorry, the... uh, uh, solution driven innovation so um the strength of, of like you know i the um the, the strength of like you know innovation driven solutions and the connection between problem driven uh innovations will really be like you know critical to developing you know um these sorts of uh these sorts of idea ideas that basically ha- make maximum impact uh in 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 society as a whole so i'll i'll, I'll give a specific example so um, in a digital platform of any sort, uh, you know, uh, transparency is a very big thing that, you know, these digital platforms like bring about. So if you think about that in the context of the underground economy, 
and you look at a digital platform in general and you connect the two. So that basically solves like a very, very big problem because like of the transparency that these digital platforms bring. And so I think that this is going to be a very, very big um, wave going forward. And I think it's going to solve a lot of problems and create a lot of impact. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, can we get your thoughts, Stephen, and then Jarvis, and then? Yeah, so we, 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 we see three, there are three main steps here. There's digitization, there's automation, uh, and then there's integration. Um, and each three of these steps yield significant uh, gains, um, although I think the, the last one probably creates the greatest gains. So actually allowing different parties to speak across your platform. That's particularly important in, in a B2B environment. Maybe in a B2C environment, we see companies basically controlling the whole flow. Uh, but if you take rice exchanges, for example, it's all about different parties talking to each other um, and being able to access the same trusted information. Yeah. Once you have trusted information, um, then you can have creation of reputation. You can have uh, 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 guaranteed um, uh, payment. Uh, these are the things which really will make your uh, your platform or your marketplace hum. Excellent. Great points. Uh, Jarvis? Oh, yes. Coming back to a point um, on integration, I totally agree with that. Um, of course, you know, if um, if all the parties involved in uh, digital, digitalization, you know, can share the data they need, um, you know, to make a decision, say, from, you know, from 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 the digital side point of view, um, if you could know more about, um, you know, your consumer, if you know more about your, uh, you know, uh, your customer, that would be really helpful for you to make a business decision in terms of uh, lending your money um, to the person uh, in the future. Um, say, for example, if we could just link, you know, um, uh, uh, the credit reference agency, um, you know, uh, the government and, and the local business, you know, together, you know, as a group, you know, uh, that will, uh, the data, you know, flowing from from the beginning to the end uh, will be perfect. So, so, so that will that will that will spur more economic growth. You know, especially in the current situation uh, of the COVID nineteen. So, so from um, so from the government point of view, uh, they need to coordinate. Um, they need to coordinate. You know, you know uh, the current regulation. Uh, they just need to tweak some bits and pieces. You know, um, just to make it happen. Okay, great. Shrikhar, what would be your last thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to make a point on the previous one on capital. I mean, if you see, I think most Indian unicorns today are owned by firms outside India. So so I think it's a fairly sore point right now in India. And I think it comes from the lack of, uh, I think, encouragement of risk capital being created. I mean, if you go to an Indian bank, they'd rather lend you $2 billion to put up a, a dead coal mine rather than because the coal mine exists rather than a, you know, a digital business model, which they say, I can't see. So, I mean, obviously, that's like now driven away, I guess, close to about $50 billion of value outside the country. So, I think, uh, I don't know whether the issue is in the rest of the market, but I think this encouragement of creating risk capital within the country, especially the financial institutions, needs to be encouraged. I mean, I think that was the point I wanted to make. And I think about, you know, I think, how do you look at digital transformation? We have a term called platformation, which we try to propagate within Sonata, uh, which is really... How do you create holistic uh, digital businesses, uh, conceptualizing ecosystems and and building these businesses through uh, in imagining what these platforms are and how they drive value to all the stakeholders who are going to be current and who are going to be in the future engaging with these platforms kind of stuff. So we call that that. So I guess I think very holistic uh, models uh, which look at ecosystem concepts and driving value to all participants. I think it's what will create more successful business models and they can also be localized to uh, local markets as you think through these kind of uh, value chains and uh, you know value systems. Absolutely. If I can just add to that. So if you look at like uh, other um, precedents, right? So you look at Silicon Valley, you look at Boston and you look at, you know, Kendall Square or you look at, um, you know, it used to be called Silicon Roundabout, which is now uh, the tech city in, in, in London. And you look at how all of these 
five, you know, uh, all of these five stakeholders have just kind of, can like come together in in each of these in each of these areas, and basically once you've brought all of those five stakeholders together, working in harmony and in tandem with one another, you just see a, you just see like a whole new in- innovation ecosystem just mm-hmm. flourish. Mm-hmm. And I think that those are the kinds of fertile grounds that are absolutely necessary to bring to the ASEAN region in order to spur um, to, to spur growth and to help bring it up to parity with, 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 with the rest of the world. And I think that those models, Silicon Valley, um, I mean, even innovation areas in, in Israel, um, you know, South Korea is another country with a very, very high intellectual, um, I mean, sorry, innovation capacity. And so I think taking these um, models, like, you know, and, and replicating that across, I think is going to be very, very key using those five stakeholders. And of course, attracting the risk capital that you mentioned. Absolutely. Especially about the risk capital, I can, identify with that i think that's uh, not only india it's probably a general asian mentality you know the risk reward ratio is a lot less there uh, than what we do expect in the us you know that mindset and, and i think europe as well